Go where your best prayers take you, unclench the fists of your spirit and take it easy. Breathe deeply of the glad air and live one day at a time. Know that you're precious and learn to trust. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to see all of you today, and it's wonderful to have sunshine, and we've had a couple of great days. Mary Hugh, thank you for those lovely flowers. We had a beautiful wedding yesterday, so the weekend's kind of rolling along. And then today, um, all of our favorites, having baptisms. I've told some of you this story, but I'll tell it again so all of you may hear it. When I was a young priest in Shelbyville, Tennessee, um, I did all the communions. It was before we really did lay Eucharistic ministers. And one of the persons I visited regularly and picked up about my second day in Shelbyville many years ago was a woman in her 90s, and she lived in the nursing home over by the hospital. And she'd been there 15 years. She'd been in bed for three of those, last 15, and could not get up. And I just delighted in going to see her, and I had a great time. It's wonderful. Her mind was so um, bright. She had done so much. She knew so much. Um, we just had great conversations, but I always left feeling like something was missing. Do you ever do that? You do something, you think, I don't know what's missing. I couldn't quite figure it out. Well, I called the priest who had been there before, and I said, you know, I said, Bob, I said, I visit Miss Virginia. He said, oh, Miss Virginia, how is she? Oh, she's doing great. She loves communion, doesn't she? I said, oh, she really does. But I said, Bob, when I leave, it's like I haven't done something. He said, well, you do take her a bottle of wine, don't you? I said, what? He said, oh, yes. He said, Miss Virginia expects you to bring her a bottle of wine. I did it all those years, and the priest before me did it all those years. He said, well, have a great day. Click. <laughs> well, the next time I went to see her, very coolly, you know, I'm being cool, I do communion, and then I had a little bag, and I said, Miss Virginia, I hope this isn't, you know, disrespectful, but I have a gift for you. And I pulled out this bottle of wine, and this beatific look was on her face. <laughs> She loved me after that. <laughs> you see, I was young, and what I didn't know, I was young. I didn't know a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know much now. I really didn't know much about ministry. I didn't know really a lot about life. I didn't know anything about aging or old age. And I'll tell you what I didn't know anything about was being debilitated in a nursing home, there, stuck there, and being treated like a child. And so I think that taking that bottle of wine, which they wouldn't provide for her or let her buy herself or, you know, go to the store for, for goodness sakes, see, was some kind of bridge, a bridge back to her past, her younger years, her independence. I don't want to make too much of it. I never asked her, what does this mean to you? But it meant a lot to her. It meant a lot to her. And she had accomplished so much, and I think it attached her to her personhood in some deep way. I am still who I've always been. Well, that wine was a symbol. It was a very powerful symbol. And what I learned from her, you see, is that everybody, everybody needs that wine sometimes. Now, I don't mean a drink, but some wine, like the people in Cana of Galilee. You've heard the story. Jesus' first act, first act, public act is to do this miracle. It's a little odd. But you see, these people need wine, and he makes some. <laughs> In fact, he makes a lot. He makes the wine. Do you catch the symbol? It's water. Now it's wine. It is the energy and vitality found in this miracle. It is the spirit in the spirits. It's not a story about drinking or alcohol. No, no, it's deeper. You see, it is a deeper story to draw you and me in if we'll be invited. It is a reminder that your life and mine, your life, needs wine. Our society needs wine. Our world needs wine. And it is the wine that God provides that the world needs. The wine that the Spirit provides. You know, I ran across a story this week of someone who I think is a towering figure. I never heard of this man, so I'm going to tell you about him. Thomas grew up in Mobile, Alabama. 
And when he was in high school, he's about my age, when he was in high school, he didn't play football or sports. Instead, he was following a different pursuit. He was going to marches, marches against the desegregation of the public school system. At 17, he joined the Ku Klux Klan and became a stalwart regular member. Shortly after that, he was taken deeper into the Klan's work. He became a member of the White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Did you see the movie Mississippi Burning? That is the man that he worked with and worked for. They blew up something about on the number of 30 to 40 synagogues and churches. The FBI had him on the 10 most wanted list along with these other people. They were considered the most violent terrorist group in America. They were caught or cornered and in a shootout, people around him were shot down. He was shot 19 times, but amazingly, even though his body was broken, he was arrested, tried, and sent to the Mississippi State Penitentiary. At the time, the most violent and worst prison in the United States. In prison, he grew worse. If he hated blacks and Jews and anybody like himself before, it got worse. And then he escaped and went on another rampage. He was out for a while, and guess what? Back into another shootout. Again, the man he was with was shot down by the FBI. He was recaptured and sent back to prison. Well, prison time was boring for him. He was a young man still, had nothing to do. He had never read much, and he began to read. He read through everything they had in the prison library. At the time, it wasn't much because the Mississippi people, um, head of the prisons, didn't think they needed to read. He ran out of all the literature. And one day he said he picked up the Bible out of boredom, not out of interest. And he started reading. And he said, you know, it didn't make any sense. None. He read it, started reading from first page to the back. He said he noticed that it got into this Old Testament, then with this thing, the New Testament got into that. He didn't know much about this and read about this Jesus. And he said the most peculiar thing happened because he read these words. What does it profit a man to gain the world and to lose his soul? And he realized he had either lost his soul or did not have one. And something changed. He had never really looked to see what he was doing. It's not known whether he actually killed anyone but they absolutely blew up those buildings. The man he was with actually did murder three people. Well, he had a jailhouse conversion, and you know how those are. Most of them are fake. We don't say that, but it's true. But he did change. He really did. In jail, he began to change. He didn't know what to do with the change either. What he didn't know while he was in jail is, and you'll have to stay with me now, the wife of the FBI agent who shot and killed the man he was with, that very agent, that man's wife had been praying for Thomas every day for years, over eight years in her church in Washington, D.C., and she'd been keeping up with him and found out that he had had a conversion. This is an amazing story. She and the FBI agent got his sentence commuted and got him out of prison because he was a changed man. He went to the University of Mississippi, Thomas Terrance did, and then he went to seminary, Thomas Terrance did. Then he went to George Mason University as the chaplain. Then he joined a staff in Washington, D.C. as the co-pastor. And then he went to run the C.S. Lewis Institute in Washington which he's just been doing. And now he's finishing his PhD. His real work became, though, very simple. I, I don't know how I don't know about him. He has traveled coast to coast, small places, big places, mostly church basements and halls like ours, 
to tell his story and to talk to people about their hatred, their anger, the violence that we perpetrate. He talked about himself. You know, right before he died, Martin Luther King must have had a vision. It's haunting. His last sermon, Martin Luther King's last public sermon, well, it was about his death. Some of you remember? He talked about his dying, and he said, whoever preaches my eulogy, please do not mention. And he said, I, I instruct you not to talk about the Nobel Peace Prize or the 400 humanitarian awards he had been given or all the schools that had recognized him, the degrees he, was, he had attained and earned, and all the ribbons that he could wear around his neck. He said, what I want you to say is that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, did the best he could to visit people in prison, and to love and serve humanity. And then in those words only he probably could say, be a drum major for peace and justice. We interpret him in many ways. But I have to say, I think history, and I sure know I joined that side of history, see him as a spiritual man, following a spiritual path, but not an easy one. A spiritual path and a faith that really does allow you to say, what are my ideals, what are my values, and to really weigh those. To be bold and step out, to count and matter for something larger than oneself. To put what you believe into practice. To make a difference in the lives of the people around you. To talk, but also to walk the talk. To live courageously, but never arrogantly. To serve by being, you see, the wine that the world needs. He was God's wine. You know, I, I think about this often. When we think these weekends, like Martin Luther King, how can I do that? It, it's just the great quandary. A Thomas Terrance. Most of us don't have these major life changes. Is that all that this presents me? And I really think if we'll be wise, it is not. We don't have to have these massive life changes in order to do and to be God's wine. Y'all know Naomi Remen, great practice oncology and right. She's amazing. And one of her patients a few years ago was a CEO of a major corporation, major guy. His name is George. He had serious cancer. Um, and he was actually responding well to the cancer treatment, but that's not what she was concerned about. She was really concerned about him emotionally and spiritually because he was just so down. And he had been a major CEO of a medical devices corporation, which he, in fact, had patented some. He was an inventor. But he just didn't see his life as contributing to anything. He just got worse all the time, even though actually he should be better. He had had two marriages, four children. He was out of touch with them, didn't have any relationship. He said to her one day, you know, I support them all and I miss them. I'm alone. I have nothing but money and I have a lot of money. And he said these words, I am an old, stupid fool. Well, she had no idea what to do. But coincidentally, Maybe ironically, one of her other patients, Stephanie, was living because of one of his medical devices implanted in her chest. And it made her think about something. So she called Stephanie and she said, I'm breaking every HIPAA rule that ever existed, but would you write this man a letter? You're alive because of him. She said, sure. And then she upped the ante. Instead, what she did is planned a dinner with her entire family, uncles, aunts, mother, father, her children, and invited this major CEO to come to her house. Amazingly, he did. And when he arrived, what he heard were all of these testimonies to what he had done for her through his work. 
I think, and hopefully it did, strike what he had done for so many people from his work. And they witnessed, too, that her life was not only improved and bettered, she was alive because of him. He had given her life. I want you to see through the lens of this man, it's not these great major life changes. It's being who we are, where we are. It's not about being perfect. I'm not sure it's about having a life change. It may be about having a soul change. The very one that we hope, Sophia Elizabeth, and Sam, who was baptized a little bit ago in the chapel, the one that they will have with us. I don't know about you, I need a soul change kind of regularly. I often think of it as like changing my oil, (laughs) but I need them. I I don't know if you do, but I seem to need one. It's something about that simple way that we let God's Spirit God's wine fill us so we can fill others. We become wine for the world. The Spirit lives through us. The Spirit lives through us. And hopefully, even though she's crying now, the Spirit will live through her. Amen.